Fauter of Ulu, Burmse, but Harriet Post Studi in Dolwood, Fauter Vlachie in Ulu. I guess Fauter Harriet Orish Akavita Shachat or the Ladu, he had finished it, Nicholas Sturgeon. First Minister, before I say any more about you, uh, I'll ask you to deliver. <laughs> <laughs> All I've said so far is to welcome you. To the the event. But, but before I say any more by way of introduction uh, of you uh, or the lecture, at Solmore we simply cannot resist showcasing our talent. Uh, and you'll understand why in a moment. Uh, we're going to hear from an ensemble of nine students uh, who are going to uh, play or sing a piece for us. They've been put together, so to speak. The group's been formed by Decker Forrest, who piped us in. Uh, the First Minister, I think it's fair to say, has been struck by the cosmopolitan nature of things here at Solmore. She's met students from Canada, uh, the United States. Uh, she's met a lady up the road in charge of the Crowleykin uh, children from uh, the Netherlands. She's met uh, a lecturer from Seattle, uh, and Decker Forrest, of course, comes from San Diego. So, there are a few Scots for the advice of that. And we're going to hear from the musicians now. They're going to play um, a piece, Gan Yile Chus a Corsedon. Seems an inappropriate, <laughs> an inappropriate choice by Decker because it translates as, this business doesn't appeal to me. <laughs> but I'm sure the music will appeal to you all. were Lauren Byrne, Lily Johnston, Amina Davidson, Alice McLeod, Diane Bruce, Joe Saunders, Angarat Whittle, Alistair Curry, Callum Ross, Marcel Garillo. And as you can tell, First Minister, while there are names there as native to Scotland and the Highlands as my own, there are others less so. And Marcel is from Spain, in fact. So the, the international cosmopolitan flavour continues. Tablev Ulla.
Now, First Minister, um, if we were paying you, I could say that we're getting our money's worth from you today. Uh, but since, in fact, the direction of travel of the cash is in the opposite direction, what I will say is that you're certainly doing us proud today. Most of your predecessors as First Minister have delivered the annual lecture at Saul Moore. Some of them have opened some of our new buildings, but uh, none of them, I think, has both opened a new building and delivered the uh, annual lecture on the same day. So thank you very much indeed for agreeing to do that in what is a packed schedule. For myself, there is about today a sense, um, if not of déjà vu, at least of the wheel having turned full circle. I was appointed chair of the board of Solmo Rostic in uh, 2007, and my first public duty was to introduce your predecessor as first minister, uh, Alex Salmond, who delivered that year's lecture, and he was then in the early days of his first administration. I finish my time as chair at the end of next month, and my last public duty is this one, to introduce you as this year's lecturer. Now, in introducing Alex Salmond, I said, and remember this was 2007, uh, and he had formed his first administration, I said that because of him, we lived in interesting times. In his response, he reminded me that may you live in interesting times is a Chinese curse. <laughs> but looking back over the intervening years, I don't know about Alex Salmond, but I certainly hadn't realized just how interesting those years were to be. Now, your predecessor, First Minister, won the 2011 election with an overall majority, not just the biggest single party, something that was thought to be barely possible given the way in which the electoral structure of the Scottish Parliament had been set up. And as we all know, in May of this year, the Scottish Nationalist Party under your leadership won 56 of the 59 Scottish Westminster seats, a result that not even Professor Curtis could have predicted until he had the results of the exit polls in his hands. And in the course of that election, you deservedly won the admiration of people of all parties in the UK and beyond, uh, attracting international acclaim. And I suppose the question many of those people who hadn't, if I can be as blunt as this, heard of you before internationally, must have asked themselves, is this, who is this remarkable person who has done this remarkable thing. Well, Nicola Ferguson Sturgeon was born in Ayrshire on 19th July 1970, and after attending Dreghorn Primary School and Beanwood Academy, she went to Glasgow University to study law. At university, she was an active member of the Scottish Nationalist Association, as it was called. Uh, so politics, and in particular the cause of Scottish independence, has been a, a lifelong passion for her. After uh, graduating and qualifying, she worked as a solicitor, first in private practice, and then at the Drum Chapel Law Centre, until she entered the Scottish Parliament as one of the original cohort of MPs elected in 1999. Now, she held various shadow ministerial appointments in that and the succeeding Parliament, when in 2004 she became the Deputy Leader of the Scottish National Party, but leader in the Scottish Parliament because Alex Salmond was still a member of the Westminster Parliament. When the SNP were returned as the largest single party and formed the Scottish Government, as I've already said in 2007, she held ministerial posts as Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, and later Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities. And it was in that role that she made the crucial intervention in the funding of the Kilbeg project when we opened in at uh, Yang Noble earlier this morning. Now, in the course of that career, she has, uh, as you would expect, won countless awards. She won the Donald Dewar Debater of the Year in 2004, 2008, and 2011, and the Scottish Politician of the Year in 2008, 2012, and 2014. Following last year's independence referendum, she succeeded Alex Salmond as party leader and first minister, 
leading the party into this year's UK election uh, with the result I've already mentioned, and establishing herself, it is fair to say, as a politician of truly international standing. One of the tests of this uh, measuring uh, worth, apparently, is how women are assessed in terms of Radio 4's Women's Hour. Uh, in 2013, Nicola Sturgeon uh, was merely the 20th most powerful woman in Britain. Uh, but in July of this year, she was rated the most powerful and influential woman in the United Kingdom. And so, First Minister, the interesting times continue, and it's a great pleasure for me to invite you to deliver the 2015 annual Solmore Ostek Lecture. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Morin Tang, uh, it, what an absolute pleasure it is to be here this morning. Uh, can I begin with a couple of thank yous? Firstly, thank you uh, hugely to these amazingly talented young musicians here. Um, that piece was stunning. Um, thank you very much for letting me hear it this morning and good luck uh, to all of you as I'm sure uh, you go from strength to strength. Uh, and thank you to you, Chairman, for uh, that very kind introduction, uh, even if you did give away my date of birth somewhere <laughs> in the midst of it. Bang goes my pretense that I'm actually only 25. Uh, but thank you uh, for what was a very generous introduction. I, I promise you I will uh, do my very best to ensure that the next few years remain as interesting, if not more so, than the last few years have been. It is a real pleasure uh, for me to be here this morning, and it is a particular pleasure, Chairman, uh, given that, as you've just indicated, this is uh, your last uh, official uh, duty as Chairman of Soma Ostag, and I want to take the opportunity, uh, I'm sure on behalf of everybody here and on behalf of everybody associated with the College, of paying tribute to you uh, and thanking you for the leadership you have shown, which has been instrumental, uh, in my view, in the success over the past few years of the college. So thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> and I know we all wish you every success in what lies ahead. Um, it's 25 years uh, this year since the first uh, Solmer Ostag lecture uh, was given by Dr. James Hunter. And I'm very acutely aware this morning that I'm following in a very distinguished tradition, one which includes, amongst many others, three of my predecessors as First Minister, and also Mary Robinson, who, when she delivered this lecture, was President of Ireland. Now, during the 25 years of this lecture, it's no exaggeration whatsoever to say that Somer Ostag has gone from strength to strength, and it's been a real joy uh, to watch that over the years. Uh, there are currently over 200 students enrolled in the higher education courses here. Many, many more people take part in shorter courses. And of course, the college is now an integral part of the University of the Highlands and Islands. And much of the research uh, done here in Tagalog and Celtic studies has been assessed as being internationally excellent. Uh, the college has also had a hugely beneficial effect on the Slate Peninsula and on Sky more generally, uh, doing a great deal to bring in visitors, to bring in businesses and residents to the area. And I think that's especially obvious today as, of course, we celebrate the opening of the first stage of the Quebec development. Quebec will become the first new village on Sky in almost 100 years. Uh, that's quite staggering, a massive achievement and further tangible evidence of the huge success that the college has been in itself, but also the huge success that the college is helping deliver uh, to Sky. It's also a real testament to the vision of Sir Ian Noble, the founder of this college, and it's absolutely fitting uh, it couldn't be more appropriate that the first new building of the Quebec development, which I've just had the privilege 
of officially opening should be named after Sir Ian Noble. And I'm delighted that his uh, widow, uh, Lucilla, is here with us today. Now, when Sir Ian established this college, his vision was partly based on the view that cultural regeneration would encourage economic regeneration. The two go very much hand in hand. And that vision really has been vindicated here in Slate over the last four decades. And it provides the underpinning, I suppose, to the message that I want to give you this morning. Because I'm going to focus very specifically today on how the Scottish Government is trying to support the Gaelic language, especially through education and culture. But I also want to talk more broadly about how we see that support for Gaelic as being just one element, albeit a vitally important element, of a wider programme of growth and regeneration for Sky and for the Highlands and Islands as a whole. The opening of the Quebec development is an ideal time to speak about that. The establishment of a new village on Skye has undoubtedly got some very special historical resonances. Uh, when this college was founded back in 1973, which as you now know, courtesy of the chairman, was when I was three years old, <laughs> Uh, Sommer Ostag, the great barn of Ostag, was a derelict building dating from the 1820s. It belonged to one of the farms established during the 19th century. And these farms had largely taken the place of communities which had emptied during the course of the Highland clearances. In the decades after the barn was built, many people would have passed it on their way to make new lives in lowland Scotland or indeed in the New World. One of the great Gaelic poets of the late 19th century was Mary Macpherson of Skye. In uh, Nurva Mioch, or When I Was Young, she reflected on the communities of her youth and she said, These fields and plains under heather and rushes, where I often cut a clump and a sheaf of corn, if I could see them peopled and houses built there, I would become joyful as I was when young. So it is, I think, a genuinely joyful occasion today to see new people, new buildings and new development take shape here at Quebec. It is evidence of the importance of this college's work over the past four decades and it also demonstrates that wider message, the significant opportunities we have to encourage Gaelic and to develop the highlands and islands in the decades to come. Because my starting point for this lecture is that the Gaelic language in Scotland, for all the undoubted challenges it still faces, and it does, is in many respects today in a much better position than it was back in 1973 when this college was founded. Now, much of that is due to the efforts of individuals and local organisations right across Scotland. Somer Ostag is an outstanding example of that. But another reason, I think, is that Gaelic has stronger political and institutional backing that, than at any time in centuries. We've come a long way since the 1970s when Serene Noble had to campaign to get a single bilingual road sign established on the road to Portree. Support for Gaelic now spans across the political spectrum. The legislation to establish Borna Gaelic uh, passed under the previous Labour and Liberal Democrat Scottish Government received at the time unanimous support in the Scottish Parliament. And of course, Gaelic is also starting to benefit from a wider change in cultural attitudes. That's something that Mary Robinson picked up on in her lecture here almost 20 years ago. She made the point, of course, she made it in relation to Ireland, that when she was growing up, people had often seen Gaelic as being very much a language of the past. It wasn't seen as relevant to the modern world. In fact, it was often seen as something that might somehow hold you back. But that's not the case now. We know that there is no contradiction whatsoever between traditional heritage and modern culture. In fact, having a distinctive heritage and being proud of it, I think, is a massive asset in the modern world today. Now, there are several reasons for that shift in perspective. Uh, they include modern technology, greater economic confidence, and as Mary Robinson argued, membership of the European Union because it encourages different nations and different cultures to interact as equals. All of these factors 
make it a bit easier for people to realise through their real life experience that Gaelic is very much a part of our future as well as a very proud part of our past. And that has big implications for encouraging young people to take up the language. For all of these reasons, cultural trends, political backing and community efforts, the census figures for Gaelic now are giving some grounds for hope. The number of Gaelic speakers under the age of 20 actually increased between 2001 and 2011. Now, I should say it was a very moderate increase, giving no room at all for complacency, but it is almost certainly the first time in more than a century that we've seen an increase in the number of young Gaelic speakers. And partly because of that, we have also seen a significant slowing down of the overall reduction in Gaelic speakers. Between 2001 and 2011, there was a decline of 1,500 people. In the 1980s, that was 17,000 people. Now, I should say, I don't think we should see that as a cause for celebration. The most recent figures still aren't good enough. A decline is still a decline, and a decline of 1,500 is still 1,500 too many. But nevertheless, I think we should recognise the progress that has been and is being made and take that as a sign of encouragement for the future. But having slowed the decline now, of course, the challenge for the future is to reverse that decline. And the first and most fundamental way of doing that is through the growth of Gaelic medium education. We've made good progress there in recent years. Since 2007, the number of primary one children starting Gaelic medium education has increased by almost a half. It's now offered in 59 primary schools across Scotland. And that growth is not confined to the northwest of the country. The Gaelic Schools Capital Fund has benefited schools across the country from Portree to Kilmarnock, from Beaumont to Cumbernauld. In Glasgow Southside, which is the constituency I represent in the Scottish Parliament, a new Gaelic primary school will open in Pollock Shields in December of this year, and it will accommodate up to 200 children. And I want to tell you a story about that school in Pollock Shields, uh, because those of you who know Glasgow will know that Pollock Shields is home to uh, the biggest concentration of our first, second, third generation Pakistani communities. So the new Gaelic medium school uh, at Glendale uh, in Pollock Shields will share a campus with the Glendale Primary School, which is over 90% children of Pakistani uh, origin. Now, I went to visit recently, and as part of the preparation uh, for uh, sharing a campus with the new uh, Gaelic medium school, uh, the teachers there had been trying to introduce some Gaelic uh, to the children in the, the main school. So I visited on this day, which is uh, just about uh, a year ago now, uh, and I went into a primary seven class, which was, I think, with the exception of one or two children in the class, all Asian children, and they greeted me in perfect Gaelic. Now, these are children, many of whom would have their first language uh, as, as Urdu, uh, but there they were in fluent, perfect Gaelic. So that's a, perhaps a sign of what I was saying earlier on, that intermingling of our cultures, each of us being confident and optimistic about our own origins and cultures uh, so that we are uh, confident in learning about others. It was one of the, uh, the best uh, and most beautiful experiences I've experienced in a primary school. Uh, so that's the, the growth of Gaelic medium education, something to be uh, hugely positive about. Uh, the Scottish Gar Government, of course, also introduced the Education uh, Scotland Bill into Parliament in March, and we're now preparing amendments to strengthen that bill. Uh, and that is about strengthening Gaelic medium education. We took a decision that it wouldn't be appropriate for the bill to absolutely require all local authorities to provide Gaelic medium education. Uh, but what the bill does do is give parents a statutory right to ask local authorities to assess whether there is a need for Gaelic medium education in their area. And it requires local authorities to respond to that request. So the bill will be the first time that local authorities have been required to consider local demand for Gaelic in this way. And I think that represents a landmark in the provision of Gaelic in our schools. In the past, of course, the health of Gaelic has been very closely linked to our education system. Most notably, uh, the 1872 Education Bill, which made elementary education compulsory 
but effectively excluded Gaelic from schools is often seen as being a major factor in the language's decline. So what we are trying to do now is to ensure that our education legislation and our school system helps rather than hinders the development of Gaelic. So we're adopting what is a proportionate but very practical approach, which I think over the years to come will help to play a part in securing the future of the language. And in doing that, we're not just emphasising school education. The more we do to support our children's learning from the earliest possible age, the better. So if we want to ensure more, ga more children learn Gaelic, it makes sense to do more to support it in the early years of education. And that's particularly important in Scotland right now because by 2020, uh, the number of hours of preschool provision that children are entitled to in this country will match the number of hours that older children spend in primary schools. That means that the level of care being made available will almost double from 600 hours a year right now to uh, more than 1,100 uh, hours a year by 2020. And the doubling of care uh, represents a major investment, uh, of course, during what will still be a very tough financial climate. It will help to give young people the best start in life. It will provide parents and families with the flexibility they need to support their own working lives. But it also means that young children in Gaelic early year settings will have more opportunities to speak the language. So we want to ensure that Gaelic preschool providers take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and today I'm announcing how we're going to allocate just over £100,000 of support for 41 Gaelic preschool education providers. Uh, the funding will assist them with day-to-day -day running costs like accommodation and it will also help them to use uh, more Gaelic speaking leaders to help children's language development. Uh, four of the groups to benefit are based uh, here on Sky in Broadford, Dunvegan, Kilmuir and Portree and the grant to each organisation, uh, while often relatively small, will nevertheless I think make a significant difference to the sustainability of the services that are being provided and that I hope is further evidence of our determination to encourage the next generation of Gaelic speakers. Of course, alongside our work to support Gaelic education, we also continue to support Gaelic culture and Gaelic media. Broadcasting is, for many very obvious reasons, an essential part of our plans and I think an essential part of what needs to be supported in order to support the strength of the language. Uh, because it's now so well established, it's probably quite difficult to remember that uh, the BBC Alipa only started broadcasting in 2008. It only became available on Freeview and cable in 2011, but now it produces almost 500 hours of original programming every year, it supports 300 jobs, and it reaches approximately 700,000 viewers every single week. Uh, its services are valued right across the country. It's programming from news and sport or the drama series Banan to special events like mod coverage. They all meet a distinctive and very important need. Its website for learning Gaelic received more than a million page views last year, which I think in itself tells us of the demand there is out there for people who want to know more about the language and learn more about it. And MG Alba is also helping many young people to gain important skills in broadcasting and digital technology. The production facilities that operates here in partnership with Somer Ostag are a major resource for filmmakers and producers. Uh, and I think they demonstrate that BBC Alipa has become a really important part of our creative economy, not just on Sky and the Western Isles, uh, but across all of Scotland. So that's uh, what we're doing to support Gaelic education and to support Gaelic media and culture. But I think it's fair to say, in fact, it's vital to say that support for Gaelic education and culture has much greater impact and will always have much greater impact if it is also accompanied by economic opportunities for Gaelic speakers. Uh, again, though they are adding hugely encouraging signs here for the Highlands and Islands uh, and therefore uh, for Gaelic, and notwithstanding the challenges that we all know uh, continue to lie ahead. Uh, next week will mark the 50th anniversary of the establishment of Highlands and Islands Development Board, now of course Highlands and Islands Enterprise. When that board was established 50 years ago, 
There was, I think it's fair to say, although uh, I don't remember this personally, uh, I'm not that old, uh, but when the board was established, there was considerable doom and gloom about the economic prospects of the Highlands and Islands. The population of the area had been in decline by then for more than a century. I think it's really important for all of us to recognise and reflect on the fact that times have changed quite dramatically since then. The Highlands and Islands have a stronger, more diverse and productive economy than ever before. And we can see the consequences very clearly in the census returns. The population of the Highlands and Islands is now at its highest point in more than a century. In fact, the Highlands accounts for four-fifths of Scotland's total population growth since the 1960s. And prospects look bright for the future too. If you look at our national economic strategy, you'll see that several of the key economic sectors that we've identified as being important to Scotland, tourism, food and drink, renewable energy, are ones where the Highlands and Islands are well placed to prosper. The University of the Highlands and Islands has also created new learning opportunities across the whole of the north of our country. And broadband technology will bring new economic opportunities as well. Now, I'm very well aware that right now virtually no properties on Sky have access to superfast broadband. This college, of course, is an exception to that. Uh, but later this year, the first exchanges in Portree will go live and more will follow in 2016. Now, back in 2013, something like 4% of properties in the Highlands had access to superfast broadband. By the end of next year, across the Highlands, that will be 84%. Uh, but we need to do more than that. 84% still isn't anywhere near good enough. And Sky, of course, is a good example of an area where even more progress is going to have to be made. Uh, that's why we're funding Community Broadband Scotland to find solutions for communities like Sky uh, which won't fully be part of that 84%. Uh, the organisation is currently helping uh, Slate Community Trust with its Skynet project, which is bringing superfast broadband to more than 100 households across this peninsula. And that's a good example of how government investment can help a committed community group, uh, which Slate Community Trust undoubtedly is, to make a major difference to the local area. And of course, our broadband programme is part of a much wider investment in infrastructure. Last week, we uh, signed the £100 million contract for two new ferries, including one uh, for the Tarbert, Lochmadi and Uig Triangle. Last month, work began in duelling the A9 between Perth and Inverness. That's the largest road infrastructure project in a generation. And that will bring benefits right across the north of the country. Uh, but we know that economic development requires much more than central or local government investment. As Sommer Ostag shows, it's often much more about local initiative and local enterprise. So we're also seeking to give local communities more power to decide and to take their own decisions. When the previous First Minister uh, spoke at this college a couple of years ago, he announced then our intention to ensure that one million acres of land were in community ownership by 2020. Uh, we've set up a group to help us achieve that target and we're also uh, currently introducing a land reform bill and trebling the size of the Scottish Land Fund which supports community buyouts. Uh, the Parliament passed a Community Empowerment Act earlier in the summer, amongst other things that requires public bodies, including the Scottish Government, to consider how to better engage and better empower local communities. And we're taking very specific steps to give more powers to islands and coastal communities. Last year, we set out uh, what I think is the most comprehensive package ever put forward by any government for empowering Scotland's 93 island communities. Uh, last month, we published a consultation paper seeking views on specific proposals for an islands bill. Uh, that bill will be an important additional step in empowering island communities. And I would very much encourage everybody here with an interest, and that will be all of you, I'm sure, uh, to respond to that consultation. Uh, we're also ensuring that when Crown Estate lands are devolved to the Scottish Parliament, the Parliament will in turn devolve powers down to local communities. We'll consult widely on the best way of doing that, but we've already made it clear that coastal and island communities will benefit from the net revenues resulting from offshore activities within 12 miles of their coast. And that's a, a further way 
to ensure that local communities benefit from their own natural resources. It's consistent, I think, with a wider vision for Scotland as a nation which is very proud of its past, confident in its future, and a nation whose natural resources can bring prosperity to every corner of our country. So our support for uh, Gaelic is another integral part of that wider vision. Uh, as I've said uh, throughout my remarks today, we want more people to learn Gaelic, we want more people to use it, and we want more people to see its relevance to their everyday lives. Uh, because in doing that, we will ensure that Gaelic contributes positively to the social and the economic well-being of local communities. I began this uh, speech by quoting the great poet Mary McPherson. Uh, I want to end it by quoting another great poet, Sorley Maclean. Uh, Sorley Maclean was, of course, a founding board member of Salmer Ostag when he wrote A Waxing Moon Above Slate in 1973. He spoke about the new college here and claimed to see a light sunbeam of the Gale's hope about its old and new walls. Uh, that Gale's hope of 1973 has been vindicated. The new walls of the Quebec development demonstrate the massive contribution that Sommer Ostag has made to Gaelic learning, to the regeneration of this Slate Peninsula, and to the culture, the economy, and the life of the Highlands and Islands as a whole. Partly because of the work done here, we do have an opportunity, I think a real opportunity, in the coming decade to reverse, not just to slow its decline, but to reverse the decline in Gaelic, which for generations almost seemed inevitable and unstoppable. That's the precious prize that I think we now have within our grasp. And the key message I want to give you today as First Minister uh, and as leader of the Scottish Government is that we will do everything we can to work with you to help seize that opportunity. Because we know that if we do that, we will protect our heritage, we will enrich our culture, we will boost our economy, and frankly, to put it as simply as possible, we'll make this country a much better place as a result. So thank you very much indeed for giving me the privilege of delivering this lecture to you today.